some reason, it doesn't want me to join my work network on Wi-Fi, and it makes me keep booting me. So let's redo it. Another one of my favorite things to talk about is being incredibly uh, critical about the, uh, our efforts and the, the training and um, really uh, how we need to be doing a whole lot better um, and how important uh, leaning into lived experience and how we can use um, lived expertise in improving our effectiveness in preventing suicide. Uh, I think this is really important to me because if you didn't know this, and, and maybe you're in circles there, but there's, there's a whole group of folks that don't even want us to call it suicide prevention anymore. Um, and they find the term suicide prevention to be um, uh, problematic. And I, I, I think that my response to that is good, then don't be a part of suicide prevention. That's okie dokie. If you don't like the term suicide prevention and you think preventing suicide is offensive, then please, by all means, get the heck out of suicide prevention um, and do whatever it is that you want to do. Um, I think suicide prevention is incredibly important. Um, and, and we'll get into the language matters in this as well when we're talking about zero suicide. Um, so I think that, uh, and, and how this connects to live experience. And one of the things I really like to point out is that suicide prevention doesn't suck, but we suck at suicide prevention. Um, we're, we are really bad at it, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're really bad at it. But one of the things that I respect about the um, healthcare community outside of behavioral health is that um, they don't say they're good at something unless their outcomes show that they're good at something. So we, we've gotten a lot better at preventing um, stroke fatalities. We've gotten a lot better at preventing um, late stage um, HIV deaths. Um, and in fact, there's some new developments that are, that are probably going to drastically reduce the number of late stage HIV deaths. We've gotten really good at um, uh, preventing heart disease uh, and leukemia. We've brought leukemia deaths way down. Um, but suicide prevention, the rate's going up. It's going up, up, up. In fact, we know getting a little uh, uh, lead on, on Missouri's data, um, we don't know exactly how much we're up, but the rate in Missouri is going to be up. I'll be surprised if we don't see a national increase for suicide again. Um, so we, as, as healthcare providers, as a healthcare treatment system where suicide prevention should be part and parcel of what we're doing, we're not good at it. Um, now, Agencies that have embraced and, and implemented in a rigorous fashion um, zero suicide efforts have brought their suicide rates down significantly. Um, the Henry Ford Healthcare System introduced zero suicide. They brought their, um, uh, their suicide rate down. You can see there's a bump up. I think there's another bump up in more recent years and it came down again. But still, after engaging in zero suicide efforts, they brought their rate down way down compared to where it was when they began. This is uh, Centerstone. Um, if you've ever heard Becky Stoll talking about Centerstone's amazing zero suicide efforts, they brought their suicide rate down um, anywhere almost to, to 60%. There have been bump ups in, in that process, but their rate is way down compared to when, uh, bef uh, when they introduced zero suicide, it dropped compared to before they were doing zero suicide. Um, we've seen this at the Family Institute um, and Missouri just recently, we uh, trained all of our community mental health centers um, in zero suicide efforts. Uh, we completed that in 2016. And starting in 2016, we started to see a suicide rate drop for people in care in the community health care system. We've had about a 30% drop of the suicide rate of people in care um, in community mental health centers in Missouri. Um, while the state rate has gone up. Now, can I say, looking at the data, that zero suicide is uh, what caused those drops? Nope. I understand data well enough to know that, that I can't go that far, but boy, there's a strong association to aggressive um, system-wide implementation of, of zero suicide efforts and large-scale drops in the suicide rate while the rate is going up at a public health and at a population level. So that's, that's fairly compelling and strong relationship. So, um, uh, so it can be done. Um, so you can see the suicide rate has been increasing uh, and, and it's uh, one of the things that should be on everybody's mind. What is going on and why aren't we doing a better job of this? So uh, this is one of my favorite slides. Um, and it, it really gets at the heart that there are several things we're going to talk about. And zero suicide is a piece of, of this effort. And lived experience is a piece of this effort. Um, but one of the things that we've been too focused on is uh, individuals at a time and intervention of individuals at a time. 
Um, and there's this whole idea of um, individual protection versus neighborhood level protection. And this graphic um, uh, really does an excellent job of showing the difference where if you have to have, everybody has to have their own umbrella. Your chance of um, someone not having an umbrella increases, whereas if the community itself has a protective element to it, even if some people have umbrellas and some people don't have umbrellas, you're going to keep more people dry, right? So one of the things um, when we talk about lived experience, when we talk about zero suicide, when we talk about suicide prevention efforts, um, this idea of creating this, uh, this neighborhood community and larger scale as you kind of stack these on, um, that more and more prevention um, efforts are put in place so that we're covering more and more people. And we're not expecting that the individual, we're going to protect each individual by themselves. So there's three steps uh, in this that I lay out that I think are really important. Um, lived experience is an important part of this. And, and part of it is a culture and a language, uh, a culture and a language change. Um, our, uh, to date, um, when people say, you know, I'll get, in, I like to argue. I don't think that's any shock to anybody who's, who's watching this, who, who, uh, who knows me. Um, one of the big arguments that I've, I've had recently with folks is people say, well, um, a prejudice and discrimination, what many people call stigma. I refuse to call stigma. I'm not going to give you my anti-stigma speech. Um, but the idea that prejudice and discrimination is down, and I, I don't believe that it's conceivably down. I think that there are some aspects that are better. Um, I think people are more open, myself being open about my own suicide attempt history. So I think there's been some changes. I don't think those changes are significant. Um, I don't think the cultural changes that we need to be more effective at suicide prevention have been significant to this point. There was a recent study that came out that showed that one of the primary barriers for rural men reaching out um, to be at risk, uh, if they're at risk of suicide, is fear of hospitalization. Well, we haven't changed the culture enough. And guess what? For these men who are thinking about suicide, the chance that they, if they did disclose their suicide thoughts to a professional, they could be hospitalized. Even if they don't want to be hospitalized, is still really high. So I think there's some aspects that I think, particularly inside the suicide prevention community, um, we've made some big changes and there's been big improvement. Um, lived experience is now a division, has been a division to AS for four years. Um, uh, we're going to add um, uh, impacted family and fans at AS, um, uh, people that are impacted by suicide. So I think we're making some cultural changes, but I don't think those changes have been significant at this point to, to help us um, uh, bend the curve on suicide. Um, we need better care for folks that are in services. We need suicide-specific care for folks that are in services. Um, one of the biggest challenges, and this is why I'm a big proponent, we should have a diagnosis for suicide, just like we have a diagnosis for a sprained ankle. Um, we've got all kinds of diagnoses that are very specific in medicine because it helps us to focus in on what we need to focus in on. We currently don't have a diagnosis for suicide um, when people do show up in healthcare setting. Here's the problem with that. Somebody shows up at the hospital, they're diagnosed um, with depression with suicide. The big problem with that is they don't address the suicide, they treat the depression, they don't do any specific uh, suicide prevention treatment, and the best that I can see from looking at the data, there's literally no evidence that treating the underlying condition, treating depression um, by itself reduces suicide. Everything suggests that if we're going to, at an individual level, treat folks that we need to use suicide-specific interventions. Um, and we allow providers to get away with this because they don't have to give a suicide diagnosis. They give another diagnosis. They treat that condition, even though that treatment's probably not going to impact the suicidality at all. And we need to improve access uh, to care for all. I mean, it is really, really hard for people to get in for services. We um, have rationed care for behavioral health in the United States of America, um, and it can be really hard, and people can have months and months of wait lists to get into appropriate care. So these are three things that we need to be working on. Uh, Kim Walton, who's a big part of the uh, Zero Suicide community, and a huge shout out to the folks at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. If you've never been to the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, check it out. They've got so many cool tools and things that you can use. They have really been driving the Zero Suicide movement. Um, Kim Walton, who is a fellow Zero Suicide faculty member, um, made this comment that if you're going to change your culture, you've got to change the conversation. So we've got to talk about these things differently, um, and that's an important part of the things that we need to do. One of the biggest areas that I like to talk about this is around competence. And I think when we talk about changing language and we talk about changing culture and we talk about lived experience, um, it, it, this is one of the, the absolute key elements um, uh, about culture change. Um, when someone has cancer or someone has diabetes or someone has broken a leg, we don't 
in any way suggest that they're incompetent because of this injury or this medical complication that they're experiencing. There's no association of incompetence with medical conditions. But with mental health and specifically with suicide, if you are struggling with this, there's an immediate assumption that you are incompetent. In fact, state laws allow us to lock people up against their will um, if they are meet certain criteria around suicide because you are incompetent. Um, Susan Stefan, who has been an amazing influence on me in her book, um, uh, Rational Suicide or Rational Laws, really hit home on this idea that, that we've attached incompetence with suicide. And, and then we treat people at risk of suicide like they're incompetent, even though all the evidence suggests treating people at risk of suicide like they're incompetent is probably the worst thing that you absolutely could do to them. Um, and so this is one of the huge culture changes and lived experience and combating this from a lived experience perspective is incredibly important. Um, I am no longer in any way comfortable with this association of incompetence with suicidality. I'm not okay with it. I, I don't know if you're okay with it, but I've, I've absolutely lost all my patients with it. Right. Um, there was, I was on a, uh, I was actually interviewed for a, a Russian cable TV show, internet TV show. Um, and as part of the interview, they brought in um, uh, someone, uh, a, a, a person from Russia currently living in the United States. And uh, this story is infuriating. And it, this happens all the time. And it gets at the root of this incompetence association. Um, this, this man um, has been having thoughts of suicide. So he calls the local mental health clinic and, and says, I'm, I need help. I'm having thoughts of suicide. And they're like, well, we can't see you. And we're not really set up to do crisis. They said, go to the emergency department. Okay. You, you're, you already hear this is going, right? So he shows up at the emergency department and he sits down with the nurse and the doctor says, I'm having suicide thoughts. They told me to come in here to get help. And so he, he gave them a list of what was going on with them and, and where he was at with, with his suicide thoughts. And they said, well, uh, given, given where you're at right now and the, and the thoughts that you're having, um, you need to be admitted. And, and um, Alexi says, um, uh, no, I don't want to be admitted. I came in to get help. I came in to talk to somebody. I'm try trying to get better here. I don't want to be in the hospital. So they called security. Uh, and um, uh, Alexi was um, hospitalized. And as Alexi's being hospitalized, and as he's telling the story to millions of people on Russian internet TV, um, he's saying, I'm telling them while they're doing this to me that you're making my life worse. I, I came in to get help. I told you what was going on with me so you could help me, and you're locking me up against my will. That's not helping. That's making everything worse. And basically, this is what we do with thousands of people at risk of suicide that are presenting it uh, for care all over the country. We hospitalize them until they figure out that if I want to get out of the hospital, I need to say I'm not having thoughts of suicide. And then we let them out of the hospital. We provide literally no specific suicide prevention care. I'm not okay with that. I I've had my fill of it. So instead of assuming that people with thoughts of suicide um, are not competent, don't have self-agency, and can't make their own decisions, which they absolutely can and should, and we should be working with that, that, um, that sense of self-agency and not against it. What if we assumed persons at risk of suicide were competent, rational, and capable beings, and we treated them with dignity, respect, and trust? This, for me, as a person with lived experience, for someone that works with people with lived experience, has friends with people with lived experience, why aren't we treating all people who are presenting for care and they're talking about suicide as capable human beings and treating them with dignity, respect, and trust? This is a huge cultural change. This is not the type of care that most people get when they present um, for uh, a suicidality or a suicide crisis. So I think uh, resources that I think are helpful that I refer people, and you guys probably all know about this, the Mighty Man, America, Man in America, Desiree L. Stages lived through this. These are all great um, uh, resources for you to get. If you're not familiar with these, um, uh, these um, resources, check them out. I uh, will freely say that I don't agree with everything that's on these sites. Um, uh, Live Through This is amazing. Um, and sometimes I love Mad in America and sometimes I, I literally blow gaskets. But they do present a perspective of people with lived experience that I think is really important for us all to be aware of. If you're a provider and you're not reading things from Mad in America or the Mighty, you're missing out on a huge opportunity to start getting a sense of what people with lived experience are saying and thinking about the care they're getting and what's important to them. And Live Through This is just an amazing site um, that everybody should be familiar with. 
Uh, another big transition is, is, and this is based on trauma-informed care that's very much connected to uh, efforts in zero suicide and the idea of recognizing people's lived experience. We need to quit asking what's wrong with you, and we need to start talking about what's happened to you. I think one of the biggest challenges we have with our diagnostic system is it's very much geared to this internal psychopathology, allegedly, that's inside of people that we need to treat or fix instead of an injury mindset. Um, and, and that when really bad things happen to people, life stressors, overwhelming things that just like when you're, you sprain an ankle or you have a broken bone, things happen and there's an injury that needs to be addressed. Um, uh, and, and what happened to you is a much less stigmatizing way of finding out what's going on in somebody's life than this mindset of what's wrong with people. Which really gets to one of the key issues in that attitudes of healthcare providers has a direct impact on outcomes in healthcare. And I think especially towards suicide. We recently had a situation where we were reviewing medical charts and some of the things that medical staff write in um, a, a person who has uh, been struggling with suicide into their treatment plan, into the, thing, the paperwork they take home, is so incredibly filled with judgment and negative stereotypes, not at all helpful. We're not addressing this and we need to be addressing this stuff. Hearing from people with experience to call this out and say, this is not helpful, it's hurtful, is really powerful, particularly providers that have lived experience. So that gets me to why zero suicide. Um, uh, I think what's really important is there's a lot of misconceptions about zero suicide and the name is really helpful in some ways and it's not helpful in others. Um, zero suicide is an internal facing continuous quality improvement program that healthcare providers should be putting in place to make suicide prevention a focus of treatment in their facilities. Zero suicide is not saying we're going to prevent every single suicide and if you don't prevent every single suicide, people are failures or we're judging people. It's the exact opposite of that. It's not a large scale a uh, huge community-faced um, uh, suicide prevention program. It's really focused on what should healthcare facilities be doing to providing the best possible suicide prevention care. Um, and, and the idea here is how many should, um, uh, what, what should we be striving for? Um, when I get in my plane and I fly a lot, I, I don't want my pilot to say, eh, I'm 90% positive we're going to land safely. There's 1% chance we're going to crash on the way to Los Angeles or Denver or wherever we're going. Look, there's always a possibility of a crash, but I want my pilot to have the mindset that my pilot, she's going to do everything she possibly can to make sure we have zero crashes on the way from St. Louis to Denver. I don't think that's too much to ask. That's really what we're saying with zero suicide. Let's put things in place to make sure that we do everything we possibly can to prevent suicides that we can prevent. One of the best examples of this, there are some people that tried to use smallpox as a good example of the zero suicide movement. I think it's completely the wrong example, Com completely way off base. Smallpox had one single cause, a virus. There's one cause of smallpox, a virus. If you can develop a vaccine for that virus, the only thing you need to do is how do I figure out how do I get everybody that vaccine? It's a singular causal illness that has a single solution and, and not, that, not that getting everybody vaccinated across the globe wasn't a huge human accomplishment, it was a big deal. But suicide is so much more complicated than smallpox, infinitely more complicated than smallpox. So um, I came across <clears throat> the APGAR score and the, the creation of APGAR, and I think it's one of the best metaphors for why zero, zero suicide is so important. So if you don't know the story of Dr. Virginia APGAR, she was a, a New York City um, obstetrician. Um, uh, she showed up in the 50s at a New York hospital. Uh, and um, a lot of people don't realize this, but prior to Dr. Apgar, when babies were born, um, if they didn't have good color or weren't breathing great, um, the doctors said the baby was failing to thrive. And the baby was actually kind of put up to the side and allowed to die. Now, in 2019, that probably sounds horrific because it kind of was horrific, but that was, that was the standard of care. This baby's not doing too good. We don't think the baby's going to make it. We need to just let your baby die. And they would literally tell the mom, this baby's not going to make it. Bad news, mom. Bad news, dad. So, of course, um, Dr. Epgar, a woman shows up in the, at the hospital and looks around what they're doing and says, what the, 
what are you doing? This is, this is the definition of insanity. You're basically just taking these babies and tossing them to the side and letting them die. Um, my first CEO of Behavior Health Response was one of the Apgar babies. She was a baby that, that before Dr. Apgar um, would have been just pushed to the side and would have died. And she lived, uh, has, is living a beautiful life, you know, 70 years later. Um, so Dr. Apgar said, well, look, I don't have any quick answers for this, but let's, let's start actually measuring, trending, and tracking these babies, and then look and see if we can do anything about their breathing or their color. Um, so she created the APGAR score, um, which was really this, this continuous quality improvement. Let's measure some things. Let's track some things. And let's see if we can do anything about these specific things rather than just pushing the babies over to the side. This was not a new technology. It was not a cure. There wasn't any specific underlying theory about why the APGAR score would save more babies' lives. It was, it was basically, let's measure, let's track, and let's just do something to see if it makes a difference. It was absolutely huge in revolutionizing newborn care. Um, increased monitoring saved lives. You, what we count is what we care about. It created the modern-day obstetrics package. Just in 2008 alone, if you look with if we had a world without APGAR, 27 mothers would have died in 2008, 27,000. And it saved about 160,000 newborns just in one year, right? Not a new technology, not some new fancy research that was put through clinical trials and, 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 and everybody agreed this was the thing to do with huge effect sizes. One clinician said, let's provide some common sense measurement and care and see what we can do to help these kids and it changed the world. Zero suicides uh, is, a, is kind of an example of that. Um, there's some basic components uh, that you have, have to have leadership commitment. You create a standardized screening and risk assessment using evidence-based screening tools for people that you have identified as at risk. Um, you create a suicide care management plan. Part of this suicide care management plan is avoiding hospitalization at all costs. I got into a huge fight with some of the suicide mitigation experts in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, they don't even want to call it, the lived experience folks in the United Kingdom don't even want to call it suicide prevention anymore. They think suicide prevention is too authoritarian. They want to call it mitigation. Um, so uh, 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 they believe that zero suicide is, leads to more hospitalizations. It's the exact opposite. In fact, one of the tenets of zero suicide is that we don't have any evidence that hospitalization is an effective treatment, and we should be doing everything we possibly can to treat people in the least restrictive environment that we possibly can. So suicide care management should really include this idea that we're going to try to keep you out of the hospital, um, that all your staff um, uh, workforce have really good workforce development training and that you're doing ongoing evaluation of the training and skills that your staff have, that you're using, this is freak out, uh, zero suicide says, hey, if you're a healthcare setting and you're treating people at risk of suicide, you need to use an evidence-based practice. I know this is crazy, right? What, what, what are you talking about? Um, there was a great New York Times story, maybe not great, it was really upsetting, but, but makes my point in a great way. A, an Olympic cyclist, a young woman, attempted suicide in, uh, in January 2019. She was admitted to a prestigious hospital, um, and she was discharged to group therapy. I don't know of any group therapy that's evidence-based for suicide prevention. She was dead a couple of months later. There's this story in the New York Times about how suicide prevention has failed. And, and I, um, I went a little, uh, I, I might have uh, gotten uh, involved in a Twitter argument with a psychiatrist involved. And I was kind of curious if, if you believe suicide prevention failed, what suicide prevention practices were used at this hospital? What evidence-based practices? None. There was literally no evidence-based practices used in this young woman's care. Now imagine this young woman, this Olympic cyclist, was diagnosed with cancer at the hospital was admitted to the hospital and they discharged her to group therapy, which has no efficacy for cancer. People would not be saying, oh, suicide prevention is horrible. They'd be saying, what is wrong with this hospital that they're not using cancer treatment for this person with cancer? That's the narrative that we really need to be talking about. Not all this other stuff, but why aren't people in healthcare and providers in healthcare and therapists in healthcare using evidence-based practices to prevent suicide? Zero suicide says, hey, you've got to use evidence-based practices. The fact that we even have to say this is a huge challenge, that you're doing follow-up, that you're closing those gaps, that you're doing ongoing quality improvement and data collection. The magic sauce of zero suicide is that we're really just using and applying really good continuous quality improvement efforts 
with the goal of preventing as many suicides as we possibly can. My question is why, why should you do zero suicide? It's why aren't you doing this in some fashion around suicide prevention? There's a great toolkit. There's academies that folks can pay for, but if you want to know more about zero suicide, the SPRC website has amazing resources. They got a list of, um, of evidence-based practices, and there's just and Mike Hogan. If you've never seen Mike Hogan, you get to watch Mike Hogan on video, and he's fantastic. The research says that when we improve access to care, we can reduce suicide. When you improve care coordination, providers are talking to each other, they're including family and friends um, and support networks, you reduce suicide. That when we, uh, when we re restrict means, when we, we really do good, counseling and access to lethal means, and build that into our treatment, we reduce suicide. Um, those are important things that we need to be focused on from a zero suicide and suicide prevention perspective. Things that don't seem to help, inpatient treatment. We literally have no evidence that inpatient treatment is suicide preventive in any way, shape, or form. We also don't have any evidence that medication-only treatment with a couple of uh, uh, maybe chlorpromazine and lithium, if those medications are used, they have some pretty strong suicide preventive research, but those medications aren't used very often. They're almost never used specifically for suicide prevention. Um, antidepressants alone are not suicide preventive. In fact, if I had to take a guess, they probably increase the risk for suicide. Okay, so... That's kind of that's kind of like a sum up of research and a quick run through of zero suicide. Questions about that before we move on to lived experience and involving lived experience in this really cool SPRC toolkit. Anything folks want to delve in deeper or talk about before we move on? It's chlorpromazine. Pretty sure it's chlorpromazine is the medication. I'm just checking chat, see if there's anything else floating around. All right. If there's no questions, anything else before we move on? Great. All right. Okay, so the, the uh, Suicide Prevention Resource Center worked with a bunch of folks um, in the lived experience community um, to uh, how do we, we keep talking about lived experience. Um, how do we bring lived experience in a formal way into healthcare and treatment settings? I think this is a really important question. It's easy to say, you need to involve lived experience um, in your efforts. Well, what does that mean? How do agencies go about doing that? How do people with lived experience get to participate in those things? And so I really appreciated the S. PRC's um, work on this, and the toolkit is available on the website. The, I'll share the link at the very end. If somebody else wants to Google it in the meantime, feel free. Um, let's get over here. First of all, what is lived experience? Um, no shocker here. Uh, suicide for, in suicide prevention, lived experience with suicide is referred to as having had suicidal thoughts or behaviors having attempted suicide, um, supported a friend, family member, or a colleague through a suicidal crisis, or lost a loved one to suicide. When Ursula was here in Missouri I, I, and presenting, I, I think our lived experience level among the providers, by this definition, was like 95%. Most people in the provider community have their own lived experience with suicide. Um, and I love the fact that when, when the lived experience uh, movement, particularly for, um, uh, for people specifically struggling with suicide attempts first came out, there was some pushback because lots of people had been living with suicide thoughts and never attempted. And they said, why, why aren't I someone with lived experience? Oh, that was a really good point. We do not want to restrict lived experience to these really narrow categories. This is a pretty good definition. How, what do we do with people with lived experience? How do we involve them in care? Most of us, I, I have a feeling most of us all in this particular webinar have, have uh, meet this definition. I certainly meet it at multiple levels. I lost an uncle to suicide. I've helped friends, family, and people in healthcare settings um, through suicide crisis. I've lost patients to suicide. Um, I'm a suicide attempt survivor, right? Most of us have layers of experience, not just one. So it's really important, this is right off the, right off the toolkit, um, LifeWorks um, and uh, Northwest uh, really did some really good stuff. And they realized that um, they needed to include the peer support staff in their implementation team for zero suicide. If you're implementing zero suicide, you don't wanna just have providers and clinicians, you wanna have HR 
in your zero suicide effort, IT in your zero suicide effort. We involve both at BHR and people that have experienced, if you have peers at your agency and you're thinking about zero suicide, you need to get your peers involved in those efforts. Um, getting peers insights and perspective on rolling out new efforts is absolutely necessary in making those efforts roll out as smoothly and be successful. So first thing, uh, first step in the toolkit is make sure you're involving the experience in your efforts. That it's a benefit to the organization itself, right? Um, crisis centers that adopted integration of lived experience report that volunteers or staff with lived uh, experience um, had a unique perspective and were able to establish rapport that in fact organizations benefit by, by bringing lived experience out of their staff, whether they're peers or providers, and that makes it easier for them to benefit and use those skills. Agencies benefit. We get more effective work and, 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 and more uh, effective um, results with people working with when we embrace and promote lived experience among our staff. It's a benefit for those with lived experience, right? It helps with their professional development, their personal development. It helps them be involved in community and advocacy, and it helps them develop a social network. So one of the things that's really key is that by including lived experience in our workplace setting, by embracing lived experience, by building and structuring it, and we'll go into more detail about how to do that. We benefit the agency and we benefit our staff with lived experience as well. Um, there is no doubt that agencies that lean into lived experience and promote lived experience, once people start talking about it, it really is a snowball. Um, it has a snowball effect. Once you get a, a, a core number of folks who are willing to talk openly about their lived experience and, and uh, they aren't struck by lightning and nothing happens to them in their job and, and they're reinforced for that, more and more people get comfortable telling their story. But you've got to get that critical mass to get it rolling. I see some chats popping up. I'll see if there's anything. All right. Let me know, folks, if there's anything you want me to stop or go over. There's level of engagement when we're engaging and bringing lived experience to the workplace. Um, the toolkit talks about different ways that we can do that. The easiest level is interview surveys and focus groups with the people we're treating, with our clients, with our patients, um, with the folks that we're working with. We should really be doing interviews, surveys, and focus groups with the people we're serving. How is this going for you? How is your experience like? What's it like when you hit the front desk? What are the reminder calls like? When we send you mail, what is that like? One of the things that's really interesting, one of the first steps uh, that happens often in zero suicide is when we're doing an academy, we ask people, what are your, your no-show letters like, right? Are your no-show letters warm and friendly? Do they encourage people to come back in, or are they nasty pants little no-show letters? If someone is really struggling and they've missed a few sessions and they're thinking about suicide and they get a letter from their agency that says, you've missed two appointments, and if you miss a third appointment, we're closing your case. Do you really think that's the message that someone at risk of suicide needs to hear and you've put it in a letter to them? So one of the first things you'll see in zero suicide groups is, is and this was based on input from their, from their the people receiving services, those letters don't help us. They don't make me want to be more uh, engaged with therapy. They push me away. These are things that we can learn. Getting consultation from people we're serving, partnering with agencies like NAMI, Mental Health Association, folks that from the family perspective, from the individual perspective, to make sure we're getting good input. Getting advisory leadership, actually having people with lived experience from the community on advisory boards. My agency has a community advisory board, and we have a lot of people with lived experience on that advisory board. We want to hear what they have to say and give them real um, input on what we're doing. Getting input from a lived experience perspective from your staff is a really deep level of engagement. When you have an agency where you can actually have people at your agency comment from their own lived experience about the care that you're providing at your agency and, and learning from that and incorporating that is a huge thing. And then finally, organizational leadership, where the leadership itself is out in the open about their own lived experience and leading the way in these efforts. So there's different layers. Any one of them helps. The more of these that you can stack on, the better. So how do we find, this is one of the things that agencies ask about all the time. How do we find people with experience? 
Well, the research suggests that if you're in a healthcare setting, particularly a behavioral health setting, more people at your agency have individual lived experience, um, certainly with anxiety, depression, and substance use, than don't. And a huge chunk of them um, probably have direct experience individually with their own suicide um, uh, crisis or, or thoughts. Um, and most of them have probably know someone close to them that has been through it as well. So our staff are one of our most readily available sources of people with lived experience. Um, so recruiting people from inside your organization is a huge, huge part of benefiting from lived experience. So when we look at people in our agencies for providing services, they're not just clinicians, they're not just caseworkers. They're also people with their own lived experience and we can benefit from that experience. We should be very active about this. Invite staff to talk about their lived experience. Ask around, find people who are willing to share their story. Make it easy to experience. Um, and to do this, one of the most effective things, uh, and it, we, when we were here in Missouri talking about this, how many of the folks at, at, at the agencies that are behavioral health agencies have people at the director or vice president or CEO, executive director level that are open about their lived experience? A lot of some of the small non-for-profits do, but a lot of the bigger ones and, and for, don't because we haven't made, okay, but you get a leader at an organization that's willing to share their own struggle with suicide, with substance use, with depression. It makes it so much easier for frontline staff uh, uh, and different staff throughout the agency to talk about it. If people do share their lived experience, if you've got staff sharing lived experience, empower them. We don't just want to talk about give them the input in things, make those roles clear, provide support, formalize it. We're bringing a bunch of staff together and we want to learn from their lived experience and help them inform how we're going to change our intake procedures or how we're going to cha change our transitions of care procedures. Give those folks a formal voice. It also builds resume. This idea of building resumes that builds on people's both their professional experience and how we're turning that lived experience into lived expertise is a huge part of embracing lived experience. Um, from recruiting outside, if you can get peers and, and create specific positions where um, you can hire people with lived experience um, as, as peers, that's an amazing way to embrace lived experience in your organization. Peers, peers, and more peers. We should create a welcoming environment. Leadership driven leaders should be disclosing and talking about their own lived experience um, and creating uh, and making it safe so that when people do disclose, that they're welcome, supported, and, and if for, I, can, I can share that for me and many of us, but think for myself, after you disclose in a professional setting, there's always this immediate desire to bring, pull it back. Ah, <laughs> I didn't mean that. I really didn't say that. We really need to normalize people sharing their lived experience, talking about it, and, and, and making sure that they feel comfortable and that, that they're helping encourage other people to tell their story as well. I can tell you in the late 2000s and, and early 2010s, there were some people that came out of their agencies and it didn't go well for them at all. I haven't heard nearly as much of that lately, but we need more folks being supported and creating safety for folks to disclose in a professional setting. Um, this is the toolkit um, at sprc.org, um, lived experience toolkit, it's that easy. Um, I gave you a really high level overview of these things. Um, uh, and there's a lot more detail um, on the actual website and the toolkit is really cool. So you should download it. Um, to kind of to kind of pull all these pieces together um, and, and big things that we need, we need suicide specific funding streams. Um, what is it MIMH like spends 50 to 70 million a year on suicide prevention at the federal level? I mean, come on. I mean, we're spending like, I don't know, 600 million on, on things like preventing traffic fatalities. We really need a much more robust and suicide specific funding stream for research and care. Um, we need robust crisis and access systems. We need hospital alternatives. There are so many people that have a choice of either an outpatient clinic or a crisis line or going to the hospital. We really need much more diverse hospital alternatives, acute stabilization units, respite spaces, urgent care for behavioral health. We need peers and lived um, expertise informed care so that when we're providing care, we're including that lived expertise lens. Um, we need to be providing services for folks when and where they want it. This idea that people should have to go into a clinic, go to an office to get services, this is 2019. There's literally no reason for the most part that you need to go anywhere to get good service, and we need to be providing more services remotely and mobily. We need data, 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 and much more accountability in the care that's being provided. 
final sum up uh, uh, requires suicide training and competence. A couple hours training is a great step forward. Missouri, I'm proud that Missouri passed a two year requirement for continuing education credits for licensed professionals, but that's not enough, right? It's a good start, but you should, two hours is, is, is helpful, but folks should be competent in suicide prevention before they leave graduate school. That competence should be reaffirmed at licensure. And just like with CPR, you should be required to re-demonstrate your competence at least a couple of every other year. Maybe not every year, but every other year. Um, compassionate care. Um, I'm, I'm no longer a proponent of empathy and empathetic care. Um, uh, compassion is very different than empathy. Um, if you actually want to get a, a good read on why I've switched from compassion to empathy, check out Against Empathy by Dr. Paul Bloom. He's a social psychologist at Yale. The book is fascinating, and he, was a, he makes a great case against empathy and for compassion. Um, I throw that out there because it's a great tease. Um, we, and this is something Susan Stefan talks about. We need protection for trained clinicians unless there's gross negligence. It should be incredibly difficult. If we want to keep people out of the hospital and prevent these overly aggressive, um, non-effective measures that many providers use, um, to, to cover their butt, so to speak. We need to give those folks that are trained in using evidence-based practices really good protection against liability. We would get better suicide prevention care if providers who are adequately trained had more protection from liability, not less. And we need to be building hope. There's, there's an awful lot of folks out there that, that, that spend a lot of time saying how horrible the treatment system is. And I got my own beat. There's lots of problems with the treatment system. I'd rather people get care than not get care. I'd rather people reach out than not reach out. Um, and we really do need to be building a lot of hope in the things that we're doing. I think it's really important. And when folks don't hope, have hope, we need to have hope for them. All right. That was an awful lot in 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, questions, comment. What are we, I put it all out there. Are there things folks want to talk about? Ursula, Crazy yeah. questions. Yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. you covered, like you said, a lot of stuff. And we've had different comments and um, questions come in some where people have self moderated those, but we'll give you a chance to take a look at that. Um, one of the questions that um, I have for you is how um, lived experience fits into um, another aspect of healthcare, although it's very rarely called healthcare. Um, how it fits into suicide crisis lines and um, and should we be including um, suicide crisis lines in the zero suicide initiative and and how does lived experience play into that? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, so I, I do and I, I think I think crisis lines um, and the research on the effectiveness of uh, crisis lines is that we've got really good support that crisis lines are effective. Um, I will tell you that that um, uh, being able to use your lived ex experience to develop lived expertise is really important. I don't think that you need to be um, disclose your lived experience as part of crisis or suicide intervention. I'm not saying never do it. I'm saying it's something that, that should be really unusual. And just because you have lived experience doesn't mean that you're better at helping people. In fact, some data has suggested that people with lived experience that particularly don't have really good training and aren't open and comfortable with their lived experience might be less effective at doing suicide intervention. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, I think lived experience is something that, um, and understanding people's perspectives um, and being able to, to remember what it was like so you can be helpful, but every person's situation is different. And even though you think your situation was really bad, it may not match up to the person you're talking with. So I have some, some tips around, a lot of people think self-disclosure is a great tool from a lived experience perspective. And I say, yeah, maybe. Um, really good validation skills. If you're really good at validating in crisis intervention, you don't need this, a good, good solid validation skills via um, DBT type training and other types of models um, uh, uh, reduce the need for self-disclosure in the first place. Um, if, uh, from, but from a lived perspective, uh, one of the things I think that does is helpful for people that are comfortable um, with it is that you can lean into how bad things are and, and you're less likely to try to uh, tell people how great life is. When in fact, when someone's in the midst of a suicide crisis, life does not feel great. And, and I think for p people who have really good training and lived experience, they remember what that's like. And they didn't want to hear this guy in the uh, pie in the sky and how amazing and, and sunshine and rainbows. Cause when people are in the mix of it, life ain't sunshine and rainbows and being able to lean into that, I think is really important. Um, for me, I didn't really start acknowledging my, my lived experience, God, 12 years after my attempt. 
Um, it was just this part of my life that I kept locked away. Um, and when I did, when I did, one of the things that really happened to me when I did start leaning into and kind of acknowledging it is it took me out of that expert, I know better and more directive mode. And I think one of the things that's really helpful for people, uh, lived experience often uh, have this idea that just because you're having thoughts of suicide doesn't mean you're incompetent. And that's important that we respect people's choices, right? So I think the expert model really is a more directive model and not nearly as effective. And I think that leaning in that lived experience, um, we're much more likely to collaborate um, and respect self agency and let people lead the process to the extent that they can. So those are key things. Um, other uh, what, what about you? What do you think? We have a, a question from Jay. Um, he was, they were asking about if there's no evidence that suicide prevention is working, how do we obtain or measure evidence-based treatment? And then Elizabeth um, chimed in that, well, we zero suicide does support evidence-based treatments like CBT, SP, and DBT treatment and collaborative and assessment yeah. uh, management of, so CAMS. Um, and, and he's still wondering, like, I'm still puzzled by how exactly we determine a treatment approach is evidence-based. So how do we, uh, I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a really important question. And it turns out that it's not, there's not a simple answer to this question. So there's some things we need to talk about. We do have evidence. We have a lot of evidence that, that suicide prevention efforts are effective. It, we're not lacking in evidence. So what's really lacking is that they're not implemented. Now, what do we consider as evidence of effectiveness? If you have randomized controlled trials, um, multiple randomized controlled trials, where you can see reductions in suicide thoughts, reduction in suicide attempts, um, and uh, sometimes a reduction in deaths, it's really difficult because the base rate of suicide is so incredibly low that, that using suicide deaths in clinical trials as an outcome measure um, is really difficult unless you have really huge sample sizes. And in fact, one of the things that Dr. David Jobes is really pointing out, and I'm on board with this 100%, we need to be less focused on reducing suicide deaths and be more upstream and treating suicide thoughts. That the new shift should be suicide thoughts are treatable. What kind of things reduce suicide thoughts? And let's attack the, the problem there. Let's inter intervene there. Um, we have lots of evidence that things like DBT, um, uh, cognitive uh, uh, behavioral therapy for suicide prevention, um, brief cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a suicide specific intervention, uh, non caring demand follow up, and collaborative safety planning um, uh, reduce suicide. And we've got multiple trials of these. Right. So in, in terms of clinical setting, there's all kinds of other methods uh, and some school based prevention programs, other things that show um, reductions in suicide as well. We have a lot of evidence about things that work and things that don't work. The bigger question is, why aren't these being implemented? Right. What's the hold up here? So one of the, my big talking points is you'll you'll see people are upset about 13 reasons why and it's not safe messaging and all oh, this and this and that. My, my big talking about why aren't we screaming our bloody lungs about the fact that 95% of the care that's being provided around suicide is not evidence based. That's that's the real challenge here. We have good techniques that improve outcomes. There's no perfect intervention. We had good techniques to improve outcomes. They're just not being used. ASIP is another one. There's like one hospital using ASIP um, in, in all of the United States of America, maybe two. Um, so we're admitting people into the hospital. 50% of people that present to emergency departments with thoughts of suicide get admitted. What do we do with them when they're in the hospital? We keep them in the hospital until they say they're not suicidal anymore, and then we let them out. That's not treatment. That's warehousing. Let's do some treatment with folks. Let's make it happen. Other things, I see CAMS, yep, ASAP. Um, love me some DBT. DBT is not readily, it's so hard to find DBT providers and getting people into really good DBT is so hard, but when you can do it, it's amazing. Other things you're thinking about. Oh, did I lose you? Thanks folks for all your, um, for being here and your support and input. Um, looks like we've had people engage from Facebook as well as those that were logged on traditionally. And um, Bart, we're so grateful that you could be here and to talk about this topic um, and to suggest solutions. Um, it takes, we're gonna need a lot of money um, to do that and a lot of manpower, but I think we've got the people ready to do it. Uh, any, yep. final, any final comments you have before we wrap up? Yep. Uh, I'll make my final comment is we, we definitely need to spend more money on suicide prevention. Um, but to, to introduce and implement uh, zero suicide efforts, most of us, like my agency, we did it with no money. 
right? Most of the agencies in Missouri that, that there was a little money to train people, bring them to an academy, but all the stuff that they're implementing, they just said, this is the right thing to do. I think that's where I'm kind of at. We can't wait for the money to roll out because we can't hold our breath. So do something, do anything to improve suicide care wherever you're at. It's these little bitty efforts. Anything you can do to improve things a little bit, you, you save one person's life. It's amazing. So that's my final comment. All right. Thank you. This webinar will be posted on unitesurvivors.org and a reminder to follow us on social media at about, uh, about so on Twitter, about or at Unite Survivors, um, as well as Facebook Unite Survivors. Thanks for joining us. We will have another webinar in the coming month and months, and we'll make sure you know about that as it arises. That's the, so September 10th is Suicide Prevention Day, and that happens soon, so make sure you're ready and um, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks for joining us today. Bye, everybody. Bye.